while later. Yeah. Yeah, we've done that before. Okay. All right. We'll wait about five minutes, then we'll get started. So no. No, we'll just keep it open. That's the easy thing to do. People are always tardy for these things. All right. All right. Nope. Okay. Hey. Sorry, I had to rush home, unfortunately. All right. No worries. We're just wait and start in, the, in the four or five minutes, give people time to zoom in. So, sounds um, good. Are you seeing the regular presentation mode on your screen? Uh, yeah, it looks like. Uh, okay. I see the slides. I see the slides. It's fine. All right. Okay. All right. Excellent. My guess is we only have a small number. Ooh, it's not too bad, actually. All right. Um, let's wait two more minutes, and then we'll get started. All right. So, and then, um, okay. Yeah, just go around to the right and then turn, take another right. Okay, not too bad. Okay. Oh. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm great. I'm excited about this lecture. Yeah, so nice to see you. So, I, are, are you feeling okay recently or? Oh uh, yeah, just just fine. Okay, very good. All right, we're gonna wait just a couple more minutes, then we'll get started. So, well worth the wait. Okay. Want to get, get started? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So we're going to get started. So um, today we're going to have a, a set of talks by uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, 
So James Brissenden, who is a cognitive neuroscientist, is going to lead off from the from the uh, Taraz Lee Lab, and uh, followed by um, I think Alex, you're going next. Yeah, Alex Johnson from Omar Ahmed's lab, and then finally Sam Crowley. Um, James is supported by um, an R21 grant on Parkinson's disease research that Taraz Lee and I have. Alex is the supported by the Udall Center, and Sam is supported as uh, research is at least partly supported by the Parkinson's Foundation Research Center of Excellence. So this is a nice, nice spectrum of different kinds of research. So we'll start with James. Okay. And actually, let me do one thing. So for any questions, I think for these Zoom talks, um, it's probably better if people save their questions for the end. Then you can either ask them or if you if you need if you want to put make sure you don't lose track of your question, just put it in the chat. All right. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, so today I'm going to present the findings of a study examining the different components of the response to levodopa treatment in Parkinson's patients and how these different uh, aspects of the L-dopa response are related to uh, one's ability to modulate the vigor of one's actions in response to the uh, prospect of reward. So dopamine replacement therapy with levodopa is a, a, a highly effective treatment for early to moderate Parkinson's disease. And it appears that the response to uh, L-dopa uh, treatment is multifaceted. So there's both a rapid component as well as a more long-term component. So immediately after uh, initiating treatment, patients exhibit an immediate improvement in motor function. Uh, so here on the right uh, is a plot, a schematic showing, so on the y-axis is motor function, so higher values indicate improvement in motor function, and the x-axis here is time. And so right after a uh, acute dose of L-DOPA, you see this immediate improvement uh, in motor function that tapers off uh, several hours later. And the time course of this effect uh, uh, parallels the plasma levels of uh, L-DOPA. So optogenetic studies uh, indicate that this uh, uh, response may reflect modulation of corticostriate plasticity. So the study uh, optogenetically stimulated uh, striatal projection neurons, and they were able to modulate uh, movement velocity. And the time course of this effect was uh, very similar to the time course you see uh, in human uh, Parkinson's patients when they take uh, dopa. So uh, in contrast, the long duration response is the sustained improvement in motor function that builds up over days to weeks following chronic treatment with L-DOPA. And so here uh, in the schematic, the dashed line uh, represents uh, a patient after one year of therapy. And the long duration response is this basically shift in baseline performance. So even you know, you know, just prior to taking a dose, their uh, motor function is improved relative to baseline and uh, may actually be uh, improved relative to the peak uh, following the short duration uh, response. So it's this improved function in the, the off state, the practical off state. Um, so the time course of the long duration response indicates that it's some sort of long-term uh, plasticity change, but unlike in contrast to the short duration response, the exact mechanism underlying uh, the long duration response are poorly understood at the moment. And uh, uh, quite recent work indicates that the LDR accounts for approximately 60% of the total response to L-DOPA, even in later stages of Parkinson's disease. So understanding what aspect of dopamine signaling is associated with LDR is uh, critically important. So dopamine signaling has been implicated in a wide range of motor and goal-directed behaviors. Um, and specifically, the dopamine has been implicated in the regulation of motor vigor. And by vigor, I mean the speed or strength of actions. So some prior studies indicate that some of the cardinal motor deficits in Parkinson's disease, such as a bradykinesia, result from a abnormal allocation of effort or vigor. 
So the study by Mazzoni and colleagues indicated that they compared uh, Parkinson's patients with controls. Um, and while the Parkinson's patient exhibited similar accuracy and speed distributions to controls, they exhibited this reluctance to uh, uh, move fast, move quickly when the energetic demands of the task were increased. And so what they proposed is that bradykinesia is actually secondary to uh, this impaired motor motivation. So impaired scaling of action to uh, uh, reward or, or cost. So a potential mechanism for this impairment is suggested by a uh, computational model developed by Yale Niv and colleagues. So in their model, tonic dopamine signaling uh, reports the long run average rate of reward. And so one idea is that the long duration response results from a restoration of uh, this tonic dop uh, dopaminergic signaling. And so what follows from this idea is the hypothesis that the induction of the long duration response will restore the link between uh, motivation and uh, vigor. So in order to examine this hypothesis, we recruited uh, newly diagnosed uh, Parkinson's disease patients that had yet to begin treatment. So we had them come in for four separate uh, sessions. The first session occurred prior to them taking their first dose of L-DOPA. They then came in, uh, it was on average, sorry, two days later uh, on average, after and then right before they started the experiment, they took their first dose of L-DOPA. So this session allows us to examine the short duration response independent of these other components of the response. Then they came back, uh, it was on average around two months later um, after they've been uh, chronically treated for that entire time. They then would uh, skip a dose um, uh, prior to coming in for the experiment. So this allows us to examine this long duration response independent of uh, any uh, short duration response. And lastly, they came in for a final session uh, after resuming uh, treatment. So this combined state matches what's, uh, what previous studies have termed like treated patients. So to examine whether the induction of the long duration response uh, results in a restoration of motivation bigger coupling, we had subjects perform this uh, incentivized joystick task. So uh, participants uh, perform this task with their most affected hand. Then on each trial of this task, subjects were presented with a reward cue. Then after a variable delay, uh, they received this go cue, and then they simply had to move the cursor beyond the outside of the boundary. Then they uh, uh, received some feedback about their performance. And so uh, as we've done in other studies in the lab, we used a, uh, a lottery-based reward scheme. And so how this worked was that at the end of the experiment, a random trial was selected. And then based on their performance on that trial, they received the reward um, associated with that trial. So on this trial, uh, the reward was $20. And so if they reached the boundary, and this, was, this trial was selected at random, they would get $20 in addition to their base pay. Uh, you could also have partial uh, performance. So if they got halfway, they could earn you know, $10 instead. Um, so this reward scheme, rather than accumulating rewards, uh, uh, encourages uh, the independent evaluation of the reward on every trial. So it, it keeps the kind of reward magnitude the same throughout the experiment. So first, I'm just gonna show results for uh, uh, two standard measures of motor function uh, that were acquired before uh, they performed this joystick task. So on the left, I'm gonna show the motor examination portion of the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, um, which was formed by uh, Roger. Uh, and on the right, I'm gonna show the results from a finger tapping task that's been used uh, previously to characterize this long duration response. So they have these two clickers that are about a foot apart and they just, tap them as many times as they can within a minute. So here's the uh, uh, motor examination score. So lower values indicate less motor impairment. So what we see is basically linear improvement across all sessions. 
indicating that participants exhibited both a robust uh, short duration response, long duration response, and then also a combined response. So they're improving in every session. And we observed a uh, very similar result uh, for finger tapping. So participants exhibit both a, a short duration response as well as a long duration response in which they uh, complete a larger number of taps uh, within the specified uh, interval after an acute dose of L-DOPA as well as after chronic treatment in the off state. And then they further improve in the uh, combined state. So now I'll discuss the uh, results for the incentivized joystick task. So this task yields two primary outcome measures. The first is simply the time it takes for them to reach the boundary, the movement. Time. And I'm subtracting out their initiation, time, the time it takes for them to initiate the movement. Then independent of how fast they move the cursor to the boundary, uh, we can also look at how precise their movements are. So given their endpoint, we can compute the most dir uh, direct trajectory to that uh, uh, endpoint. We can then compute a measure of error from this more direct route. And so specifically, we computed the root mean squared error across all time points until the boundary is reached. So this is a, a, a essentially just the average deviation from that more direct trajectory um, for that trial. So I'll first present uh, the results for uh, movement time. So here the y-axis is movement time, the x-axis is the amount of reward, and the different panels are the different sessions. So here we see movement time for the baseline session. Critically, we do not see uh, evidence for normal modulation of movement speed according to reward. And if anything, we're seeing maybe a, a slight increase uh, in their uh, uh, movement time with reward. So now that here are the results for, uh, for the short dur duration response session. So we see this robust short duration response. So they're uh, on average about 40 milliseconds faster to move beyond, uh, and this is just two days later after they've taken their first dose of uh, L-DOPA. However, we still do not see any modulation of their movement time uh, with reward. So they're not scaling their actions according to their reward. Now here's the third session in which they've been chronically treated uh, for eight or so weeks. And despite missing a dose, subjects are able to maintain their basic speed improvement relative to baseline. However, in uh, contrast to this hypothesis that the uh, uh, long duration response is sufficient to restore this motivation bigger link. We actually don't see any uh, modulation of movement speed by reward. And lastly, here is their uh, uh, results for the fourth session. So this is the combined state. So they exhibit even further improvements relative to the uh, second and third sessions. And uh, we now see this uh, modulation of their movement speed by the uh, reward magnitude. So they are faster for the $20 trials than they are for the uh, low reward $5 trials. So now I'll show uh, participants movement error across sessions. So here's their error in the baseline session. So uh, interestingly, you see this maybe slight decrease in uh, error with um, reward. However, there's an issue here is that when you look at speed and accuracy measures in isolation, that it's susceptible to these speed accuracy trade-offs. And so you can see that actually this decrease in error is accompanied by this flight increase in their, their, their uh, uh, movement time. So this is, yeah, uh, basically a classic speed actually trade off. So that's what this blue curve represents here. So higher accuracy is associated with slower responses, lower accuracy is associated with uh, faster responses. And so basically, it's not a true change in performance if you are moving along this blue curve. Okay, so here is the second session. Um, we really, it's actually not a significant difference in error. 
But so in terms of overall performance, they basically are maintaining the same level of precision as the baseline, but they've, they're doing so at a, a much faster rate. And here's the third session. So now they are actually uh, uh, improving the precision of their movement um, while maintaining their uh, speed advantage. So uh, um, they're faster than baseline and more accurate. But critically, we're not, we're still not seeing any modulation of their movement precision by a, a reward. Then in the last session, uh, we again see an improvement in their precision of movement and mirroring the movement speed results. They are uh, um, basically being modulated. They're more accurate for $20 than $5. So in this case, they're actually moving off this curve and getting a, a not only more accurate, but uh, faster. So I'll just last show a uh, measure that tries to account for this trade-off between uh, uh, movement speed and accuracy. So what we did was uh, compute this movement efficiency measure. And so essentially, we just z-scored the movement time and error for each trial and then average two. So now this measure equally weights their movement time and their error. Um, so this is a measure of their overall kind of efficiency of movement, overall performance. And so now we see that basically there is no, it just cancels out. And so they're not actually, there isn't actually any modulation of performance by reward. And uh, you see this large uh, short duration response. But again, no modulation by uh, reward. An improvement now um, in the uh, LDR session, but no modulation. And then finally, uh, uh, a further improvement in their efficiency, and you now see uh, modulation of their uh, movement efficiency by reward. And nicely now, when you compute this overall uh, uh, performance metric, it mirrors kind of this linear improvement you see in these other uh, measures of motor function. So uh, to conclude, uh, go back to this hypothesis, does the induction of the long duration response restore the motivation and vigor link? No, it appears that while the long duration response is necessary, it's not sufficient to restore the relationship between motivation and response vigor. So this argues against proposals that uh, bradykinesia is uh, uh, solely secondary to uh, deficient reward vigor modulation. So we observe this large improvement in bradykinesia uh, in the second and third sessions, but no modulation of uh, performance by reward. So this leaves this question of what is actually restoring this uh, uh, bigger motivation link. Um, if we, this is all very speculative, but if we make this assumption that uh, the short duration response is this modulation of corticostriate plasticity, and that the uh, long duration response is this restoration of the tonic uh, Dopamine signaling, perhaps you you need the combination of both. And this was a, a potential model for this was suggested in this paper by Etri and uh, Dudman, where uh, the plasticity would shift the mean, but they, you had this restorative set point um, that was potentially determined by this tonic signaling. So potentially the long duration response is acting as this scaffold for the then the short duration uh, uh, response modulation of this uh, uh, plasticity. Okay, and uh, yeah, thank you all for your okay. great. So I think we have time for one or two questions or anyone, yeah, anything in the chat. That, no. Okay, if not, we'll just go ahead with the next talk because we have a lot to talk about. All right, I think let's let's stop sharing. I think Alex is next. All right, excellent. All right. Mm -hmm. The mouse. Oh. Where do we get? Normally, like when you point up your view, the center like shows up there, but it wasn't. Right. <laughs> so I was trying to kind of go between them. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Too many windows open here. All right. <laughs>
close all of these. That looks like you. Yeah. All right. I go up here. We have to share a screen. Okay. Is that the one? Oh, there it is. Yeah. All right. Black background. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. I doubt that very much. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, can someone just confirm that we're seeing Alex's presentation, please? Yes, it's in presenter it. mode. If you want to project it to full screen, that might be great. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Alex, do you know how to do that? Because I'm always confused by that. Yeah. Soft screen. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah. How many PhDs does it take to share a screen? Well, actually, I handling AV equipment is the primary criteria. Chairman. So obviously, I'm not in that category. So. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. All right. And then if I hit the laser pointer, are we all able to yep. see that okay? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Alex Johnson. I'm a relatively new postdoctoral fellow working with Omar Ahmed here. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about some electrophysiological signatures that we're uncovering that help define a basal forebrain retrosplenial cortex circuit for us. Um, first, if it's okay, just because it's the first time many of you uh, folks have met me, um, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm actually a former Wolverine. I graduated back in 2013. Then I spent about a decade in California where I eventually got my PhD in cognitive science. I used in vivo electrophysiology to study spatial representations across the hippocampus, subiculum, retrosplenial, and posterior parietal cortices. And I was very happy to return to University of Michigan with this opportunity to apply my background in cognitive science and electrophysiology towards the study of Parkinson's disease. Um, as it's often introduced, Parkinson's disease is seen um, a lot of the time as a movement disorder. This is in part due to the fact that people who are living with Parkinson's disease will have a depletion of dopamine entering their basal ganglia. This can lead to an overactivation of the indirect pathway and manifest as a tremor as these people are moving. However, um, as we're becoming, we're beginning to learn more and more about, partially due to many of the folks here in this committee, um, people who have Parkinson's disease also will experience a number of cognitive changes to their day-to-day -day life. When these people are experiencing some of these changes, such as um, depression, we'll oftentimes see a decrease in acetylcholine binding in the cortex or an associated atrophy of acetylcholine-releasing neurons in the basal forebrain. Um, however, cognition is a relatively broad term, and to be a little bit more specific about the types of symptoms I'm going to be focusing on, I think this person does a very eloquent job describing their experience with Parkinson's disease. I used to walk alone in the wood, fog or no fog. But when the symptoms of Parkinson's disease appeared, I noticed that I could not orient myself anymore. And in the case of fog, I got lost. Now I am too disabled to get lost anymore. This person's description of the changes that accompany the Parkinson's disease symptoms we typically talk about highlight a change to his ability to navigate familiar spaces, the woods behind his house. He, should be very familiar with that. If we wanted to look in the brain for where these symptoms may manifest, we would look at the retrosplenial cortex primarily. This is because people who have suffered damage to this region of cortex, either through an accident or a stroke, will oftentimes display similar issues navigating around their familiar places. They could get disoriented easily, or in the case of this patient that uh, was illustrated down below, 
they're unable to, from memory, reproduce a map of the place around their home. Home is labeled in A there. Many aspects of these clinical findings in people have also been reproduced in animal models such as mice and rats. Now you can't get a mouse or a rat to draw a picture of their home, but they can navigate on mazes. And that's very important for my work because I'll be uh, primarily introducing data from mouse models. Now, if you were to listen to the electrophysiology of the retrosplenial cortex, you would first find that there's a number of individual neurons that are exhibiting very strong orienting signals, such as this head direction down here in the lower right. This is one individual neuron that has its firing rate plotted as a function of the direction that the animal is facing within the room. So if uh, zero degrees is north, we might call that where the projector is. And this particular neuron would fire every time the animal was facing that direction in the room towards the whiteboard. But it isn't just the individual neurons that are uh, engaging with navigation. The local field potential or the EEG within the brain is also engaging with the navigational state of the animal. In the retrosplenial cortex, like a few other regions, you'll see a predominant four to nine hertz oscillation as animals are actively navigating around their environment. However, only in retrosplenial cortex do you also see the presence of what we call spline oscillations. These are very fast oscillations that occur only at the peaks of our theta waves. Beyond the function of retrosplenial cortex, the anatomy is very provocative as well, in part due to the very large and, and substantial cholinergic input coming from the basal forebrain. In fact, in our hands, in the Ahmed lab, when we looked for the source of acetylcholine axons within retrosplenial cortex using a retrograde tracing virus, we found that the primary uh, neurons that were labeled were located in the horizontal body or horizontal limb of the diagonal band of Broca, which I'll abbreviate HDB. Now, HDB and retrosplenial cortex have been getting more attention in the recent decades for study, but they haven't truly been studied together. How does HDB impact retrosplenial cortex or vice versa? I know that I've just introduced a whole lot, so I wanted to take a second just to summarize the, the introduction for a second. People who are living with Parkinson's disease will sometimes experience an atrophy of acetylcholine releasing neurons in the basal forebrain. These exact neurons are projecting presumably to the retrosplenial cortex. We know from volumes of literature that retrosplenial cortex is critical for uh, an accurate navigation of space. And an accurate ability to navigate space is one of the cognitive challenges that some folks living with Parkinson's disease can experience. And although this circuit seems as though it ought to be very important, it hasn't fully been studied together. So today I'm going to be talking about some work where I'm looking into what meaningful ways HDB neurons are interacting with the retrosplenial cortex. I've got a few pilot mice that I'll be presenting data from today. Um, and this is the general schematic for the current work and future work that I'm planning. I'll be using uh, acute electrodes to record the brains of these mice, both hemispheres of retrosplenial cortex, as well as the HDB. This is what that will look like um, after the recording. This is my neuropixel off to the left here. It's about one centimeter long. And it's a high density recording electrode, which means every 10 microns or so, you've got another electrode contact. Um, and that's very important for us because the regions that we're targeting are relatively small. So being able to, with high accuracy, say exactly where we're recording from is very important to us. This is actually what the mouse will look like as we're doing the recording. This is our heroic mouse standing atop a treadmill ball. 
And what we're going to be asking our mouse to do is in response to an LED that gets presented to him to run forward and that running forward will decrease the intensity of the light. At the end of that, he'll be presented with a nice yummy milkshake reward, so he's got plenty of motivation to do it. Why we want the animal engaged with running behavior is seen from this example trace from one of my electrodes. This is just one second of data, and the raw trace is here in black, showing a nice seven hertz oscillation in the retrosplenial cortex. We can isolate just the theta component, the four to nine hertz component of that, and I've uh, plotted that in blue. And we can also calculate what's known as the analytic amplitude. So how much of this oscillation is present at any given time. With our other electrode, which is positioned in HDB, we'll be recording the activity of individual neurons that I've isolated. These individual neurons have their action potentials discharging, and I'm uh, identifying the discrete time points that that's occurring. Because one way that you can look at these neurons to begin with is to calculate the time interval, pardon me, the time interval that is in between every action potential this neuron discharges. When you plot the distribution of those time intervals, it gives you a peek into the intrinsic ability of these neurons to fire in a rhythmic fashion. For example, this neuron here has multiple bumps in its ISI plot and they're evenly spaced at about 125 milliseconds apart. That tells me that this HDB neuron likes to fire in a rhythmic fashion to the theta oscillation. This becomes more clear when we show a uh, simultaneously recorded neuron just to the left in gray. This neuron, this ISI plot, does not show rhythmicity. But we can ask for these rhythmic neurons, how specifically is it interacting with the retrosplenial cortex theta oscillation? And to that end, I've calculated a number of tuning curves where I'm plotting the firing rate of this neuron as a function of aspects of the theta oscillation. So as the theta oscillation increases in power, and this is normalized from zero to one, as the theta oscillation increases in power, this neuron will reliably increase its firing rate as well. Additionally, we can ask, well, how does the theta oscillation itself organize the firing of this neuron? To help us see that, I've just overlaid in blue one stereotypical theta cycle on our plot because you can define the position along theta with regard to its phase, zero to 360, one trough to the next, and this neuron, it appears, really, really likes what I call the rising edge of theta. Its firing rate increases almost exclusively to that rising edge, and then it drops quite substantially. This is very interesting to me because this would suggest this rhythmic neuron is not only firing with regard to theta, but to a particular point in this theta oscillation. We can look at one other rhythmic neuron that I've recorded and see many of the same characteristics I was just describing. The ISI plot shows rhythmicity. The firing rate increases as a function of retrosplenial theta power. And this neuron is also tuned to a particular phase of theta. However, I want you to notice that the tuning of this neuron, number four, is slightly different than the previous neuron. This neuron prefers the peaks of theta, and I find the heterogeneity in that tuning to be very fascinating. If you want to um, try and unpack what could these neurons be doing firing at different phases of theta, well, we should look at what is theta doing in the retrosplenial cortex. Retrosplenial cortex theta multiplexes other rhythms that we can observe. I had already mentioned that at the peaks of theta oscillations, there are these very fast lines, which across hemispheres are actually antiphase and may be indicative of some form of interhemispheric communication. Well, just preceding those spline oscillations reliably are these somewhat slower gamma oscillations that actually are in phase across hemispheres. And so with this multiplexing, 
of rhythms happening on top of the theta oscillation within retrosplenial cortex, it becomes natural to ask, well, are my neurons that I'm recording that are tuned to different phases of theta contributing or gating these oscillations in any way? Um, one thing that I will want to identify to answer that is what's the molecular identity of these neurons? So my plan to uncover what the molecular identity of those neurons are is to first classify the neurons according to their rhythmic profile. Are they intrinsically rhythmic? Do they tune to theta and retrosplenial cortex? And then I can use optogenetic technology to optotag just the cholinergic or just the PV positive neurons, make themselves known, and I'll have an idea of what they're doing during my recording. Ultimately, this technology can also be used to turn up or turn down the cholinergic tone in retrosplenial cortex, either through a channel rhodopsin or an inhibitory one. And when I do a manipulation like that, I'm expecting to see if these neurons truly are influencing gamma and spline oscillations, I would expect to see a change in their uh, presentation on top of the retrosplenial cortex theta. I would also expect to see a change in behavior. Remember that a lot of my motivations came from the, the experiences people living with Parkinson's came from. And so the change of behavior uh, that we would expect uh, would require a task. And we've got our mice doing uh, just three relatively simple uh, distance measurement tasks for us. The first one that I had been describing was uh, the one we had seen previously. The mouse learns that when the LED comes on, he's able to move away from that initial position and that will decrease the LED intensity. The next condition, is going to actually ask the animal to pay a little bit more attention to where he is in the task, because now, as we'll see our mouse uh, who's performing it, he no longer runs to the end of, of the trial where the LED is all the way off. He now has a target about 60% of the way, and the LED is, is helping him along the way. It's cueing him as to his position. However, if we wanted to see a true distance integration task, we'll um, be going to the third iteration of this, which is still getting off the ground. So I haven't got um, any data to present. And just like before, the LED will be presented to the animal. However, now as the animal moves away from that initial position, the LED is turned off. And you may imagine the animal needing to imagine what would the LED intensity be at this position in order to hit that target. It's just as before, but without that LED cueing the animal, telling him where he is. This experiment in part was inspired by the, the work Quincy Almeida had been presenting last year. Um, and I'm very excited to see not only how the HDB retrosplenial cortex system operates during this distance integration, but how changing acetylcholine tone might make the animals more or less accurate to hitting their target. Um, and uh, I would just like to thank the entire UDAL committee. This is you know, my first postdoctorate, and you guys have been incredibly welcoming and great to me. Um, and I'd really like to thank Professor Ahmed as well. He's giving me a place to do my work. And not only that, but he runs a lab full of really, really wonderful people. And it's a, a true joy to come in every day. So thank you. Super. Excellent. Um, open for questions. Let me just ask, I should know the answer to this, but for the tracing, so what's been described, I think, in the I think in primate basal forebrain is actually that there's clusters of neurons that innervate different cortical fields. Is yeah. that what you're seeing with the tracing? So um, yeah. the tracing work was actually done by a technician before I had joined, but that's really in line with Zaborski's work, right, exactly. with the modulation or modules of basal forebrain. Yeah, so um, Zaborski's a big uh, yeah. No, he's done a lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Let's see if there's the chat or anything. That's that is pretty quiet. Okay. Well, we can people can think of some more questions. So let's go to um, Sam for last talk. Okay. So I think we're just right on time right now, which is perfect. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh,
yeah, we, we get we get a yeah, stop, stop uh, share stop first. Share. Yeah, first. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. Let's see. Oh, we can't do that. All right. Okay, I gotta get out of this. But we'll just open yours up, I think, if I can get to that. Just, I can't do that. All right. What did I do before? I'm trying to remember. Let's close that first. That, that, okay. Out. You want to open your top up? Where is this one? I think this one here. Okay. Screen. Is this one yours? That one right there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. I think. Okay. Someone tell us if we're doing the right thing here in terms of the. Can you see the right presentation? Uh, it's not in presentation mode yet. It's, it is or it isn't? It, it is not. Okay, yeah. so it looks okay? No, we did. No. Just project it. It's projected? You just need to project it like you did for the second oh. reason. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah. All right, he's going to be the next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's that? Okay, there we go. Is that it? All right. Great. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, that last talk was really great and really dovetails nicely into what I'm going to talk about. Um, so we'll go from the uh, small view to the 20,000 foot view. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the basal forebrain acetylcholine and cognition in Parkinson's. Um, so usually I start out this talk by uh, emphasizing the importance of acetylcholine and Parkinson's. I don't think that'll be necessary for this group. Uh, so I'm really just gonna start here by talking about how acetylcholine um, influences cognition in Parkinson's. And there are a couple of different theories. Uh, the one I'm gonna emphasize is uh, one put forward by uh, Nico Bonin and his group. Um, which is broadly called the compensatory hypothesis. Um, so the idea behind the compensatory hypothesis, uh, it's really a three-piece uh, three piece process. The first is that dopaminergic denervation occurs as cells are lost in substantia nigra, which of course is required for a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, and that affects the basal ganglia, which causes uh, frontal lobe dysfunction through corticostriatal loops. Um, so, or it would cause cognitive dysfunction, however, uh, acetylcholine in frontal cortex compensates for that dopaminergic denervation, um, which initially preserves cognitive functioning. And then over time, uh, acetylcholine levels decline in some people with Parkinson's, which then leads to cognitive dysfunction. Uh, and as far as evidence for this theory, there's uh, several different papers that Nico's group has put out. Um, the, the, one of the original ones is shown right here. Uh, so the, this, is, uh, this is a group of people who had both cholinergic and dopaminergic PET scanning, um, and they were categorized as having low levels of dopamine uh, in, uh, in basal ganglia and caudate specifically, or low levels of acetylcholine at cortex. And then they also got comprehensive cognitive testing. So this group here had uh, denervation of acetylcholine as well as denervation of dopamine. And you can see they are fairly cognitively impaired. This group here, these three groups are really where you'd see significant cognitive impairment. Whereas the group that only had abnormal dopamine uh, and had um, normal acetylcholine really didn't have very significant cognitive impairment. There are a couple of people here, but the spread is much more in this kind of extremely mild or no impairment zone. So this seems to suggest that acetylcholine denervation is uh, important for cognitive dysfunction in Parkinson's. So then the next question becomes, what is the reason for that? Uh, and it's likely because, as Alex said, uh, because of the nucleus basalis of Minert and pathology in that region. 
So to get into a little more granular detail, um, there are three major pathways coming from the NVM, which you can see right here, it's this blue strip. The first is the medial pathway, um, which follows the cingulate and also goes to the orbital frontal cortex. The second is this lateral capsular pathway, which uh, feeds acetylcholine to a pretty big part of cortex, including lateral prefrontal cortex here, uh, and also kind of uh, posterior frontal cortex as well as parietal cortex, and importantly, also medial temporal cortex. And then the third is this lateral parasylvian division, which feeds mostly lateral temporal cortex as well as insula. So these are the three major divisions uh, coming from this small nucleus uh, that provide acetylcholine to cortex. Uh, and there's a good amount of evidence that these, uh, this nucleus is affected fairly early in Parkinson's at about Brock stage four. Uh, the fun cocktail party fact that probably only Parkinson's researchers would care about is that uh, the nucleus basalis was actually the first place where Lewy bodies were isolated, uh, where Frederick Lewy found Lewy bodies. So um, we, we've known for a long time that it's affected. Um, it also has a high degree of cell loss in this region in Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, almost as severe, if not more severe, than in Alzheimer's disease. So clearly this is an important region. And more recently, um, through some innovation in imaging, we've been able to image this region um, and get some volumetric measurements as well as some other physiological me measurements, which have shown that um, lower nucleus basalis volume is associated with cognitive decline. Smaller nucleus basalis, uh, people with smaller nucleus basalis and Parkinson's are more likely to convert to PDMCI, and nucleus basalis uh, mean diffusivity is higher in those that convert to PDMCI. So these things all kind of combine to really suggest that uh, the nucleus basalis is the reason for that cholinergic denervation, um, which then leads to cognitive decline. So I say suggest that because important, uh, and then, <laughs> sorry, I forgot about that slide. So the, the next question would be, um, is there a way that we can measure these things before we start to see volumetric loss in this region? And the answer to that may be yes, uh, through inflammation. So alpha-synuclein uh, causes inflammation through a number of different processes. It activates microglia, also activates pro-inflammatory pathways, and also activates astrocytes. So it inflames uh, through a number of different processes. And there are a couple of different ways that we can look at inflammation in the brain. Um, one of the newer ways to do that is using a metric called free water fraction. Uh, so free water fraction is fairly straightforward. It's derived from diffusion MRI scans. And the idea is that it uses an algorithm to determine what proportion uh, of volume in each voxel in the brain consists of extracellular water. So this can be used to look at cell density, which it is down here. And you can see in these kind of gray areas, right? You would expect lower cell density, which would mean more extracellular water, and you have a higher free water fraction. Compare that to somewhere like the corpus callosum, where you have much higher cell density, so you're gonna have lower free water fraction. So cell density is one thing that free water fraction can reflect, but it can also reflect inflammation. Um, that's been shown in a number of different disease processes. Um, and also in mouse models. Um, and there are a couple of studies now looking at free water fraction in uh, the nucleus basalis. Uh, so one of these studies found that people with higher nucleus basalis free water fraction and Parkinson's had slower reaction time. Uh, and then this enterprising young man uh, made a dissertation a couple of years ago um, investigating free water fraction and cognition in a longitudinal uh, cohort. And I found that uh, higher free water fraction, people with higher free water fraction declined significantly more across a number of different cognitive domains over a two year period. So it seems like uh, free water fraction may be a sensitive metric to nucleus basalis uh, integrity that may occur before uh, volume loss. So this raises a couple of different questions. So we do know a couple of things here. First of all, we know that acetylcholine uh, in Parkinson's is associated with cognitive function. The second thing that we also know is that nucleus basalis physiology, both volume and uh, free water, is associated with cognitive function. But what we don't know is uh, how this third arm fits in here. So how is acetylcholine associated with nucleus basalis 
uh, physiology, and how does all of that uh, play into cognitive function in Parkinson's disease? And the second question that we don't know the answer to is how does inflammation, how is inflammation associated with these things? So if free water is uh, uh, reflecting inflammation, can we look at inflammation and see if that associates, can we look at inflammatory biomarkers and see if that associates with free water? So this is really uh, the, the focus of my study and our study here. Um, so to investigate that, uh, we leveraged 103 participants with Parkinson's disease um, from the Udall Center uh, project grant. They had a, a whole host of data that we leveraged. The first was to look at basal forebrain volume and free water fraction um, from diffusion and structural MRI. The second was to look at uh, FEOBV PET imaging, which is a presynaptic uh, cholinergic uh, PET ligand. Um, so for this one, I for this metric, I averaged the cholinergic uptake in the anatomically uh, derived regions from earlier. So if from that medial pathway, um, the parasylvian pathway, and the capsular pathway. And then uh, the uh, money I was awarded, we used to get analyses of inflammatory cytokines in blood samples that we had. So you can see the cytokines that we got analyzed here. Uh, a number of them are consistently shown to be elevated in Parkinson's disease, which is why we wanted to get those. And then of course, the last thing that we looked at was cognitive uh, functioning. These participants had comprehensive cognitive assessments. Um, we have, I focused on four different uh, cognitive domains here. Uh, the first is attention and working memory. So working memory being keeping information in your brain for a short period of time. Um, immediate memory, uh, which is memory that uh, is a little bit longer than working memory, but is uninterrupted. And then delayed memory, which is uh, recall for information after a longer delay. And then also executive functioning, um, which is kind of a broad term for things like multitasking, reasoning, problem solving, what we broadly would call uh, higher order uh, cognitive functioning. And this is the most common impairment that you see in people with Parkinson's disease, which is why it's important to investigate here. So as far as the statistical model, we looked, we looked at these things using mediation analyses. And just as a quick review, because I know I needed it, um, so I'm sure there might be a couple of people out there who uh, also need it. I'm gonna walk through how a mediation analysis works. So uh, you start with looking at the total association between two factors. So in our case, first, we wanted to look at the total relationship between acetylcholine levels in those three regions and cognitive functioning. And the way mediation works is that you look at whether an indirect relationship between first acetylcholine and in our case is basal forebrain and then basal forebrain and cognition uh, explains a significant amount of this relationship between acetylcholine and cognitive function. So the total relationship is C. The indirect effect is the uh, product of arm A here going from acetylcholine to basal forebrain and uh, part B here going from uh, basal forebrain to uh, cognitive functioning. So you look at this area and you see if that's significant. If this uh, path is significant, then a mediation has been achieved. Then the question is, is that mediation partial or full? So that's when you look at the direct pathway here, which is the effect after controlling for the indirect effect. If that path is still significant, then you, then you say that there's been a partial mediation achieved. If it is uh, not no longer significant, then that means that you've achieved a full mediation. And that would mean that basal forebrain physiology fully explains the relationship between acetylcholine levels and cognition. So these were the two domains uh, that showed significant mediations for basal forebrain free water, which is what we're starting with here. The first thing you could, so just to uh, uh, orient you a little bit, the yellow here means that it's a partial mediation, which again means uh, C prime is still significant, whereas green means a full mediation, meaning that the physiology in the basal forebrain, in this case, the free water, fully explains the relationship between acetylcholine and cognitive function. So within, within the attention domain, uh, basal forebrain acetylcholine 
partially mediates, or uh, excuse me, uh, free water partially mediates the relationship between acetylcholine and cognitive function in the medial pathway, which again follows a cingulate cortex, back to retrosplenial cortex, and the lateral capsular pathway, which is a, later, a lot of lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, as well as uh, medial temporal cortex and parietal cortex. For executive function, which again is the most affected cognitive domain in Parkinson's disease, free water fraction in the basal forebrain fully mediates the relationship between acetylcholine and cognitive function in all three of the pathways uh, that we examined. So uh, that was part one. Part two, we looked at volume. Um, vol volume showed different relationships. So there was no relationship with attention or at least no mediation, but there was mediation in delayed memory in the lateral capsular pathway, which again uh, encompasses part of those medial temporal regions. Uh, as well as the lateral parasylvian pathway, which is the lateral temporal region. So it, may, it makes sense that that may be more associated with uh, memory function. Um, executive function did show some mediations. Uh, basal forebrain volume fully mediated the relationship between uh, acetylcholine and the lateral parasylvian regions and cognitive function, but not in the other two. So the relationships aren't quite as strong there. Uh, I did also want to talk about the inflammation biomarkers. Uh, we're still kind of working with a lot of this data, uh, but we have shown a couple of interesting results. So these are the results that came back from the lab. Um, as you can see, not a lot of people had elevated levels of these biomarkers besides MCP1, though that's not uh, as strongly associated with Parkinson's as some of these others. Um, so for these analyses, I collapsed these groups into three groups. The first had zero to one elevated inflammatory biomarker, the second group had two, and the third group had uh, three or more elevated biomarkers. Um, and these are just kind of the starts of some intriguing results we have. None of these relationships are significant, um, but uh, just, just a kind of intriguing start. So these are the three pathways. You can see medial here, lateral capsular, and uh, lateral parasylvian. And in all three, we see uh, that the people who have higher levels of these inflammatory biomarkers consistently have um, lower acetylcholine in these regions. Again, as you can see, not significant, but they do also have slightly higher free water fraction within the basal forebrain. And then finally, they, sh they have uh, lower cognition uh, across all four of those domains we examined than the other two groups. So it does seem like there's an association here. Um, the initial plan was to do a, a moderated mediation, although that's not really showing up as significant. So we're still uh, we're still trying to figure out how to incorporate this data here. So as a quick summary of our results here, um, cortical basal forebrain free water mediates the relationship between acetylcholine and executive function uh, across all three pathways and as well as attention. And this may reflect some earlier level of pathology. So if we follow the theory that this reflects inflammation, which may become before the volumetric loss, then perhaps that's what we're seeing here, which is why executive function um, is more uh, is fully mediated by those. Um, contrast that with the cortical basal forebrain volume, which mediates the relationship between temporal regions and delayed memory. Um, so that may suggest that the volume loss is more related to memory decline, which we do see it's tend to see a little bit later on in Parkinson's. Um, and then we also see elevated inflammatory bar markers associated with lower acetylcholine, higher corticobasal forebrain free water, and lower cognition. I'm just kind of a start to a couple of things there. Um, we have a couple of things that we're still trying to uh, achieve with this grant. First, we want to investigate individual nuclei in the basal forebrain, um, and especially looking at nucleus basalis, since we haven't uh, isolated that specifically yet. Uh, and also we're going to acquire some additional inflamm inflammatory biomarkers so we can do more uh, nuanced analyses with those biomarkers. So I want to thank everyone at the Udall Center, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Alvin and Dr. Bonin for providing uh, funding and also uh, all of this really excellent data. I want to thank the, the members of my lab as well, particularly Dr. Hampstead for uh, mentoring me on this project. Thank you. Um, any questions? I think we're just out of time, actually, so probably only have one or two. Any questions? Okay.
Um, that being the case, I think uh, we're going to go into executive session. I want to thank all the speakers for really a really fun set of and very varied set of talks. So much appreciated. So, okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, all right. Excellent. Is this yours? Yes. Yes. You don't want to leave that behind. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Um, oh. Oh. Okay, can everyone see the agenda? Okay, all right. Um, so we're just gonna have a, a short meeting, I think. Um briefly, just to keep everyone up to date. Um, so the first thing is our carry forward request. It is being processed by uh, NINDS. I'm nagging them about that. Um, it, it's, uh, I did discuss this with our program officer and, and she's quite sympathetic to the request. So I'm anticipating that it will be approved, but I can't tell you when, because they are just being, they're just super inefficient there, but it is, it is ongoing. Um, second thing is, you know, as everyone here knows, we're in the midst of our RPPR. Um, so the the I thank all of you for submitting your progress reports. I think Nancy has all of them. Um, I think we'll be we should actually be done with the RPPR quite soon. All the paperwork and get that submitted, which is a real it's it's just a pain in the ass to do it for center grant. So anyway, thanks to everybody for being so compliant and prompt. Um, couple things, as I think most of you know, Martin Sarter has decided to retire, and uh, which is, you know, unfortunate for us because we all enjoyed working with Martin a lot. But fortunately for us, Kent Barrage has agreed to take over his, his project. So thank you very much, Kent. Um, yeah, we're going to go down there. Yeah. Um, I think we haven't discussed this, and we've discussed Martin's replacement with our program officer, and um, she's She's quite uh, sympathetic and uh, recognizes Kent as the outstanding scientist that he is. So this isn't a problem for us, I'm happy to say. Um, I think we will also not immediately be replacing Kathy Spino as the biostats correlator. Kathy uh, and her group were just fortunate enough to receive a very large grant from uh, another NIH institute to be a data coordinating center for a large family of clinical trials. And I think that's gonna knock out her effort as, as being a participate. So we will probably be recruiting another person to replace her in the near future. Um, next thing is uh, our update talks of which we had a nice set today. Um, we have upcoming talks. Um, Enrico Opri, who is a junior faculty member in, in bioengineering here who's worked on deep brain stimulation is gonna give a talk next month. Gordon Shepard from Northwestern will be visiting us uh, for an in-person talk in May. Bernardo Sabatini will be giving uh, from Harvard will be giving a Zoom talk uh, in June. Then we'll be on summer hiatus. Um, the September, we will uh, presumably there will be an in-person Udall meeting in Washington, DC. So we won't have a meeting that month. Um, per Borghammer, who has done some very interesting proposals on subtyping of PD, We'll be giving a Zoom talk from Denmark in October. And then I would like all of you to suggest people for talks for the coming year. Um, some talks will be uh, about uh, updates in Udall projects, but this is an opportunity to invite people for talks. And um, the Zoom talks have generally worked quite well and allowed us to have some international talks as well. So please send me some, some nominations. Otherwise, I will, I will fill them up with people that I'm interested in. Um, and I think also we should have some discussion about changing the meeting time. Um, I think right now, for instance, I think it's very difficult for Nico to attend these meetings. And I think Kent, I think you have some, some conflicts as well. Is that correct? 
Yeah. Well, um, I, I, yeah. right now I teach from two thirty to four on on Wednesdays, but in next yeah. semester I'll be teaching from one to two thirty. Thirty, right, right. So I think um, now the, the 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 one problem we have is is finding rooms in particular. So I'm trying to encourage people to to have more in person attendance, and I'll probably make an issue of that over the summer. But it takes us a long time to find a suitable room. So I think we will probably start. We'll start looking into finding a, a different time that maybe everyone make a bit a little bit easier for everybody. Um, okay. Um, just so you know, in June we have our annual outreach symposium for um, for particularly for our research participants and other interested lay parties. Uh, Kelvin Chu is is organizing this. It's going to be held at Laurel Manor in Navalonia. This is the first time since the pandemic that we've had an in-person meeting of this type. Uh, David Standard, who's the chair of neurology and the Udall director at, uh, in Alabama, is going to give a talk. And then uh, we'll have several presenters talking about Udall-related research and Parkinson's disease-related research, including Alex and Sam, who you heard this morning. And then the last thing is we have their centers meeting will be, I think, in Bethesda in person this year. So please hold, I, I, we're not expected to send everybody in the center, but a lot of people are expected to go. So please block out that time on your calendar, if for no other reason than to participate via Zoom. And then in December, we'll have an external advisory board meeting. And um, I think that's it from my point of view. I don't have any other, um, any other business items. Does anyone else have anything else to suggest or? Okay, I will be nagging people about various things then, all right? And um, and I, again, thanks to everybody for getting in your materials for the, for the um, RPPR so promptly, all right? Okay, thanks very much. Bye. All right. We want.